Chapter 6 The Trap of the White Sphinx About eight or nine in the morning I came to the same seat of yellow metal from which I had viewed the world upon the evening of my arrival. I thought of my hasty conclusions upon that evening and could not refrain from laughing bitterly at my confidence. <laughs> Here was the same beautiful scene, the same abundant foliage, the same splendid palaces and magnificent ruins, the same silver river running between its fertile banks. The gay robes of the beautiful people moved hither and thither among the trees. Some were bathing in exactly the place where I had saved Wiener, and that suddenly gave me a keen stab of pain. And like blots upon the landscape rose the cupolas above the ways to the underworld. I understood now what all the beauty of the overworld people covered. Very pleasant was their day, as pleasant as the day of the cattle in the field. Like the cattle, they knew of no enemies and provided against no needs, and their end was the same. I grieved to think how brief the dream of the human intellect had been. It had committed suicide. It had set itself steadfastly towards comfort and ease, a balanced society with security and permanency as its watchword. It had attained its hopes to come to this at last. Once, life and property must have reached to almost absolute safety. The rich had been assured of his wealth and comfort, the toiler assured of his life and work. No doubt in that perfect world there had been no unemployed problem, no social question left unsolved and a great quiet had followed. It is a law of nature we overlook that intellectual versatility is the compensation for change, danger, and trouble. An animal perfectly in harmony with its environment is a perfect mechanism. Nature never appeals to intelligence until habit and instinct are useless. There is no intelligence where there is no change and no need of change. Only those animals partake of intelligence that have to meet a huge variety of needs and dangers. So, as I see it, the upper world man had drifted towards his feeble prettiness and the underworld to mere mechanical industry. But that perfect state had lacked one thing even for mechanical perfection, absolute permanency. Apparently, as time went on, the feeding of the underworld, however it was affected, had become disjointed. Mother Necessity, who had been staved off for a few thousand years, came back again, and she began below. The underworld being in contact with machinery, which, however perfect, still needs some little thought outside habit, had probably retained perforce rather more initiative, if less of every other human character, than the upper. And when other meat failed them, they turned to what old habit had hitherto forbidden. So I say, I saw it in my last view of the world of 802,701. It may be as wrong an explanation as mortal wit could invent, it is how the thing shaped itself to me, and as that, I give it to you. After the fatigues, excitements, and terrors of the past days, and in spite of my warm grief, this seat and this tranquil view and the warm sunlight were very pleasant. I was very tired and sleepy, and soon my theorizing passed into dozing. Catching myself at that, I took my own hint, and spreading myself out upon the turf, I had a long and refreshing sleep. I awoke a little before sunsetting. I now felt safe against being caught napping by the Morlocks, and stretching myself, I came on down the hill towards the White Sphinx. I had my crowbar in one hand, and the other hand played with the matches in my pocket. And now came a most unexpected thing. As I approached the pedestal of the Sphinx, I found the bronze valves were open. They had slid down into grooves. At that, I stopped short before them, hesitating to enter. Within was a small apartment, and on a raised place in the centre of this was the time machine. I had the small levers in my pocket. So here, after all my elaborate preparations for the siege of the White Sphinx, was a meek surrender. I threw my iron bar away, almost sorry not to use it. A sudden thought came into my head as I stooped towards the portal. 
For once, at least, I grasped the mental operations of the Morlocks. Suppressing a strong inclination to laugh, I stepped through the bronze frame and up to the time machine. I was surprised to find it had been carefully oiled and cleaned. I have suspected since that the Morlocks had even partially taken it to pieces while trying in their dim way to grasp its purpose. Now, as I stood and examined it, finding a pleasure in the mere touch of the contrivance, the thing I had expected happened. The bronze panels suddenly slid up and struck the frame with a clang. I was in the dark, trapped, so the Morlocks thought. At that, I chuckled gleefully. I could already hear their murmuring laughter as they came towards me. Very calmly, I tried to strike the match. I had only to fix on the levers and depart then like a ghost, but I had overlooked one little thing. The matches were of that abominable kind that light only on the box. You may imagine how all my calm vanished. The little brutes were close upon me. One touched me. I made a sweeping blow in the dark at them with the levers and began to scramble into the saddle of the machine. Then came one hand upon me, and then another. Then I had simply to fight against their persistent fingers for my levers, and at the same time feel for the studs over which these fitted. One, indeed, they had almost got away from me. As it slipped from my hand, I had to butt in the dark with my head. I could hear the Moloch's skull ring to recover it. It was a nearer thing than the fight in the forest, I think, this last scramble. But at last, the lever was fitted and pulled over. The clinging hands slipped from me. The darkness presently fell from my eyes. I found myself in the same grey light and tumult I have already described. I have already told you of the sickness and confusion that comes with time travelling. And this time I was not seated properly in the saddle, but sideways and in an unstable fashion. For an indefinite time I clung to the machine as it swayed and vibrated. Quite unheeding how I went, and when I brought myself to look at the dials again, I was amazed to find where I had arrived. One dial recorded days, and another thousands of days, another millions of days, and another thousands of millions. Now, instead of reversing the levers, I had pulled them over so as to go forward with them. And when I came to look at these indicators, I found that the thousands hand was sweeping round as fast as the seconds hand of a watch into futurity. Very cautiously, for I remembered my former headlong fall, I began to reverse my motion. Slower and slower went the circling hands until the thousands one seemed motionless, and the daily one was no longer a mere mist upon its scale. Still slower, until the dim outlines of a desolate beach grew visible. I stopped. I was on a bleak moorland, covered with a sparse vegetation and grey with a thin hoarfrost. The time was midday, the orange sun shorn of its effulgence, brooding near the meridian in a sky of drabby grey. Only a few black bushes broke the monotony of the scene. The great buildings of the decadent men among whom, it seemed to me, I had been so recently had vanished and left not a trace. Not a mound even marked their position. Hill and valley, sea and river, all under the wear and work of the rain and frost had melted into new forms. No doubt, too, the rain and snow had long since washed out the Morlock tunnels. A nipping breeze stung my hands and face. So far as I could see, there were neither hills nor trees nor rivers, only an uneven stretch of cheerless plateau. Then, suddenly, a dark bulk rose out of the moor. Something that gleamed like a serrated row of iron plates and vanished almost immediately in a depression. And then I became aware of a number of faint grey things, coloured to almost the exact tint of the frost-bitten soil, which were browsing here and there upon its scanty grass and running to and fro. I saw one jump with a sudden start, and then my eye detected perhaps a score of them. At first I thought they were rabbits or some small breed of kangaroo. Then, as one came hopping near me, I perceived that it belonged to neither of these groups. It was plantigrade, its hind legs rather the longer. It was tailless and covered with a straight greyish hair that thickened about the head into a sky terrier's mane. 
As I had understood that in the Golden Age man had killed out almost all the other animals, sparing only a few of the more ornamental, I was naturally curious about the creatures. They did not seem afraid of me, but browsed on, much as rabbits would do in a place unfrequented by men, and it occurred to me that I might perhaps secure a specimen. I got off the machine and picked up a big stone. I had scarcely done so when one of the little creatures came within easy range. I was so lucky as to hit it on the head, and it rolled over at once and lay motionless. I ran to it at once. It remained still, almost as if it were killed. I was surprised to see that the thing had five feeble digits to both its fore and hind feet. The forefeet, indeed, were almost as human as the forefeet of a frog. It had, moreover, a roundish head with a projecting forehead and forward-looking eyes obscured by its lanky hair. A disagreeable apprehension flashed across my mind. As I knelt down and seized my capture, intending to examine its teeth and other anatomical points which might show human characteristics, the metallic-looking object to which I have already alluded reappeared above a ridge in the moor, coming towards me and making a strange clattering sound as it came. Forthwith, the grey animals about me began to answer with a short, weak yelping as if of terror, and bolted off in a direction opposite to that from which this new creature approached. They must have hidden in burrows or behind bushes and tussocks, for in a moment not one of them was visible. I rose to my feet and stared at this grotesque monster. I can only describe it by comparing it to a centipede. It stood about three feet high and had a long segmented body, perhaps thirty feet long, with curiously overlapping greenish-black plates. It seemed to crawl upon a multitude of feet, looping its body as it advanced. Its blunt round head, with a polygonal arrangement of black eye spots, carried two flexible, writhing, horn-like antennae. It was coming along, I should judge, at a pace of about eight or ten miles an hour, and it left me little time for thinking. Leaving my grey animal, or grey man, whichever it was, on the ground, I set off for the machine. Halfway I paused, regretting that abandonment, but a glance over my shoulder destroyed any such regret. When I gained the machine, the monster was scarce fifty yards away. It was certainly not a vertebrated animal, it had no snout, and its mouth was fringed with jointed dark-coloured plates, but I did not care for a nearer view. I traversed one day and stopped again, hoping to find Colossus gone and some vestige of my victim. But, I should judge, the giant centipede did not trouble itself about bones. At any rate, both had vanished. The faintly human touch of these little creatures perplexed me greatly. If you come to think, there is no reason why a degenerate humanity should not come at last to differentiate into as many species as the descendants of the mudfish who fathered all the land vertebrates. I saw no more of any insect colossus, as to my thinking the segmented creature must have been. Evidently, the physiological difficulty that at present keeps all the insects small had been surmounted at last, and this division of the animal kingdom had arrived at the long-awaited supremacy which its enormous energy and vitality deserve. I made several attempts to kill or capture another of the greyish vermin, but none of my missiles were so successful as the first. And after perhaps a dozen disappointing throws that left my arm aching, I felt a gust of irritation at my folly in coming so far into futurity without weapons or equipment. I resolved to run on for one glimpse of the still remoter future, one peep into the deeper abysm of time, and then to return to you and my own epoch. Once more I remounted the machine, and once more the world grew hazy and grey. As I drove on, a peculiar change crept over the appearance of things. The unwanted greyness grew lighter. Then, though I was travelling with prodigious velocity, the blinking succession of day and night, which was usually indicative of a slower pace, returned and grew much more marked. This puzzled me very much at first. The alternations of night and day grew slower and slower, and so did the passage of the sun across the sky, until they seemed to stretch through centuries. At last, a steady twilight brooded over the earth, a twilight only broken now and then when a comet glared across the darkling sky. The band of light that had indicated the sun had long since disappeared, for the sun had ceased to set. It simply rose and fell in the west, and grew ever broader and more red. 
all traces of the moon had vanished. The circling of the stars growing slower and slower had given place to creeping points of light. At last, some time before I stopped, the sun, red and very large, halted motionless upon the horizon. A vast dome glowing with a dull heat, and now and then suffering a momentary extinction. At one time it had, for a little while, glowed more brilliantly again, but it speedily reverted to its sullen red heat. I perceived, by this slowing down of its rising and setting, that the work of the tidal drag was done. The earth had come to rest with one face to the sun, even as, in our own time, the moon faces the earth. I stopped, very gently, and sat upon the time machine, looking round. The sky was no longer blue. Northeastward it was inky black, and out of the blackness shone brightly and steadily the pale white stars. Overhead it was a deep Indian red and starless, and southeastward it grew brighter to a glowing scarlet where, cut by the horizon, lay the huge hull of the sun, red and motionless. The rocks about me were of a harsh reddish colour, and all the trace of life that I could see at first was the intensely green vegetation that covered every projecting point on their southeastern faces. It was the same rich green that one sees on forest moss or on the lichen in caves, plants which, like these, grow in perpetual twilight. The machine was standing on a sloping beach. The sea stretched away to the southwest to rise into a sharp, bright horizon against the wane sky. There were no breakers and no waves, for not a breath of wind was stirring. Only a slight, oily swell rose and fell like a gentle breathing, and showed that the eternal sea was still moving and living, and along the margin where the water sometimes broke was a thick incrustation of salt, pink under the lurid sky. There was a sense of oppression in my head, and I noticed that I was breathing very fast. The sensation reminded me of my only experience of mountaineering, and from that I judged the air to be more rarefied than it is now. Far away, up the desolate slope, I heard a harsh scream and saw a thing like a huge white butterfly go slanting and fluttering up into the sky, and, circling, disappear over some low hillocks beyond. The sound of its voice was so dismal that I shivered and seated myself more firmly upon the machine. Looking round me again, I saw that quite near, what I had taken to be a reddish mass of rock was moving slowly towards me. Then I saw the thing was really a monstrous crab-like creature. Can you imagine a crab as large as yonder table, with its many legs moving slowly and uncertainly, its big claws swaying, its long antennae like Carter's whips waving and feeling? and its stalked eyes gleaming at you on either side of its metallic front. Its back was corrugated and ornamented with ungainly bosses, and a greenish incrustation blotched it here and there. I could see the many palps of its complicated mouth flickering and feeling as it moved. As I stared at this sinister apparition crawling towards me, I felt a tickling on my cheek as though a fly had lighted there. I tried to brush it away with my hand, but in a moment it returned, and almost immediately came another by my ear. I struck at this and caught something thread-like. It was drawn swiftly out of my hand. With a frightful qualm, I turned and I saw that I had grasped the antennae of another monster crab that stood just behind me. Its evil eyes were wriggling on their stalks, its mouth was all alive with appetite, and its vast ungainly claws smeared with an algal slime were descending upon me. In a moment, my hand was on the lever and I had placed a month between myself and these monsters, but I was still on the same beach. I saw them distinctly now as soon as I stopped. Dozens of them seemed to be crawling here and there in the somber light among the foliated sheets of intense green. I cannot convey the sense of abominable desolation that hung over the world. The red eastern sky, the northward blackness, the salt dead sea, the stony beach crawling with these foul, slow-stirring monsters, the uniform, poisonous-looking green of the lichenous plants, the thin air that hurts one's lungs, all contributed to an appalling effect. I moved on a hundred years, and there was the same red sun, a little larger, a little duller, 
The same dying sea, the same chill air, and the same crowd of earthy crustacea creeping in and out among the green weed and the red rocks. And in the westward sky, I saw a curved pale line like a vast new moon. So I traveled, stopping ever and again in great strides of a thousand years or more, drawn on by the mystery of the Earth's fate. Watching with a strange fascination, the sun grow larger and duller in the westward sky, and the life of the old earth ebb away. At last, more than thirty million years hence, the huge red-hot dome of the sun had come to obscure nearly a tenth part of the darkling heavens. Then I stopped once more, for the crawling multitude of crabs had disappeared, and the red beach, save for its livid green liverworts and lichens, seemed lifeless. And now it was flecked with white. A bitter cold assailed me. Rare white flakes ever and again came eddying down. To the northeastward, the glare of snow lay under the starlight of the sable sky, and I could see an undulating crest of hillocks, pinkish white. There were fringes of ice along the sea margin, with drifting masses further out. But the main expanse of that salt ocean, all bloody under the eternal sunset, was still unfrozen. I looked about me to see if any traces of animal life remained. A certain indefinable apprehension still kept me in the saddle of the machine, but I saw nothing moving in earth or sky or sea. The green slime on the rocks alone testified that life was not extinct. A shallow sandbank had appeared in the sea, and the water had receded from the beach. I fancied I saw some black object flopping about upon this bank, but it became motionless as I looked at it, and I judged that my eye had been deceived and that the black object was merely a rock. The stars in the sky were intensely bright and seemed to me to twinkle very little. Suddenly I noticed that the circular westward outline of the sun had changed, that a concavity, a bay, had appeared in the curve. I saw this grow larger. For a minute, perhaps, I stared aghast at this blackness that was creeping over the day, and then I realized that an eclipse was beginning. Either the moon or the planet Mercury was passing across the sun's disk. Naturally, at first I took it to be the moon, but there is much to incline me to believe that what I really saw was the transit of an inner planet passing very near to the Earth. The darkness grew apace. A cold wind began to blow in freshening gusts from the east, and the showering white flakes in the air increased in number. From the edge of the sea came a ripple and whisper. Beyond these lifeless sounds, the world was silent. Silent? It would be hard to convey the stillness of it. All the sounds of man, the bleating of sheep, the cries of birds, the hum of insects, the stir that makes the background of our lives, all that was over. As the darkness thickened, the eddying flakes grew more abundant, dancing before my eyes, and the cold of the air more intense. At last, one by one, swiftly, one after the other, the white pinks of the distant hills vanished into blackness. The breeze rose to a moaning wind. I saw the black central shadow of the eclipse sweeping towards me. In another moment, the pale stars alone were visible. All else was rayless obscurity. The sky was absolutely black. A horror of this great darkness came on me. The cold that smote me to my marrow and the pain I felt in breathing overcame me. I shivered and a deadly nausea seized me. Then, like a red hot bow in the sky, appeared the edge of the sun. I got off the machine to recover myself. I felt giddy and incapable of facing the return journey. As I stood sick and confused, I saw again the moving thing upon the shoal. There was no mistake now that it was a moving thing against the red water of the sea. It was a round thing, the size of a football, perhaps, or it may be bigger, and tentacles trailed down from it. It seemed black against the weltering blood-red water, and it was hopping fitfully about. Then I felt I was fainting, but a terrible dread of lying helpless in that remote and awful twilight sustained me while I clambered upon the saddle. And so I came back. For a long time I must have been insensible upon the machine. 
The blinking succession of the days and nights was resumed. The sun got golden again, the sky blue. I breathed with greater freedom. The fluctuating contours of the land ebbed and flowed. The hands spun backwards upon the dials. At last I saw again the dim shadows of houses, the evidence of decadent humanity. These too changed and passed, and others came. Presently, when the million dial was at zero, I slackened speed. I began to recognize our own pretty and familiar architecture. The thousand's hand ran back to the starting point. The night and day flapped slower and slower. Then the old walls of the laboratory came round me. Very gently now, I slowed the mechanism down. I saw one little thing that seemed odd to me. I think I've told you that when I set out, before my velocity became very high, Mrs. Watchett had walked across the room, travelling, as it seemed to me, like a rocket. As I returned, I passed again across that minute where she traversed the laboratory, but now her every motion appeared to be the exact inversion of her previous ones. The door at the lower end opened, and she glided quietly up the laboratory, back foremost, and disappeared behind the door by which she had previously entered. Just before that, I seemed to see Hillier for a moment, but he passed like a flash. Then I stopped the machine and saw about me again the old familiar laboratory, my tools, my appliances, just as I had left them. I got off the thing very shakily and sat down upon my bench. For several minutes I trembled violently. Then I became calmer. Around me was my old workshop again, exactly as it had been. I might have slept there and the whole thing have been a dream. And yet, not exactly. The thing had started from the southeast corner of the laboratory. It had come to rest again in the northwest, against the wall where you saw it. That gives you the exact distance from my little lawn to the pedestal of the White Sphinx, into which the Morlocks had carried my machine. For a time, my brain went stagnant. Presently I got up and came through the passage here, limping, because my heel was still painful and feeling sorely begrimed. I saw the Pall Mall Gazette on the table by the door. I found the date was indeed today, and looking at the timepiece saw the hour was almost eight o'clock. I heard your voices and the clatter of plates. I hesitated. I felt so sick and weak. Then I sniffed good wholesome meat and opened the door on you. You know the rest. I washed and dined, and now I am telling you the story. I know, he said after a pause, that this will be absolutely incredible to you. To me, the one incredible thing is that I am here tonight in this old familiar room, looking into your friendly faces and telling you these strange adventures. He looked at the medical man. No, I cannot expect you to believe it. Take it as a lie, or a prophecy. Say I dreamed it in the workshop. Consider I have been speculating upon the destinies of our race until I have hatched this fiction. Treat my assertions of its truth as a mere stroke of art to enhance its interest. And taking it as a story, what do you think of it? He took up his pipe and began, in his old accustomed manner, to tap with it nervously upon the bars of the grate.